This is based on some papers that we've uh, previously published, um, windswept deformities, recovatum, etc. <clears throat> Now, once life was very simple, you had an ambassador in a Fiat, you had Pepsi and you had Coke and you had Air India and Indian Airlines. Now, of course, you have lots of choices. In knee replacement, we had mechanical alignment, which most people followed, and then a few tried anatomical alignment. And you've heard all this before, so fortunately, we can go through this quickly. And then with the advent of constitutional or inherent alignment, as it was called, there were two papers. One was from Bellamons in the European population, in the Western population, and one was from our uh, combined study of the Japanese, Chinese, and Indian population, which said basically the same thing, that nobody was at 180 degrees, but in a few degrees of varus, and a handful of people were in few degrees of valgus. So, in addition to this, you've already heard this, you had kinematic alignment, and then you had the uh, adjusted mechanical alignment and the restricted kinematic alignment. So now when you talk about cuts in TKR, the cuts and releases go hand in hand. So this will vary with the alignment philosophy that you adopt. Now if you do mechanical or anatomical alignment, you're making the same cuts in all cases and therefore you will require releases. In kinematic alignment, you're making cuts which are specific to that patient, therefore you may not require releases. And then you have some combination of the two, adjusted mechanical and restricted kinematic, which is basically a hybrid technique, where there will be releases, but, but much less. Now, how do you decide on this? It depends on your experience and training. Your interpretation of the outcome measures and evidence available what instrumentation you have available to you to be able to execute this one, two, two and a half degrees of rotation um, for achieving these type of, on a predictable and regular basis, not on a one-off basis. And lastly, it should also depend on the deformity type and severity, varus, valgus, etc. So now we've shown that most of the times, by just removing the osteophytes, particularly in a varus deformity, you can achieve gap balance. And we've also shown that you don't really need to release the collateral ligament, even for severe deformities. <clears throat> so now if you're just sticking to mechanical alignment, you aim for a 180 degree alignment in this valgus knee, you will place your implants 90 degrees to the mechanical axis of the femur and tibia, but you see the blue arrow, it shows you you'll have to do a substantial release in order to be able to get your alignment correct. So alignment and balance using mechanical alignment with cuts at 90 will require significant releases. This is an extension. You may also have an imbalance in flexion so this would be a typical situation where if you did mechanical alignment, your tibial cut is at 90, your femoral cut to get your gap right <clears throat> will require you to cut more. Uh, you'll have to adjust this. You either have to release laterally in order to get it balanced or you will have to do it in such a way that you are incorrectly rotating the femoral component. If you do not wish to do releases and leave it as such, you will be therefore internally rotating the femoral component in order to achieve balance. So remember that your femoral component is not designed for an internal rotation for your patella, but that may happen in a very severe deformity. Anatomical uh, alignment, again the same thing. If you follow this principle, you will keep the tibia in a few degrees of varus and the femur in valgus. It may be okay on the, in extension, but when you come to your flexion gap, because of your three degree varus slope on the tibia, you will have a substantial release to perform in order to get a balanced gap. Now, if you were to do a kinematic alignment, that's great. You don't need to do any release, generally speaking but you will leave the limb in significant valgus when you uh, just cut the bones, taking into account the amount of wear as well as 
what is your implant thickness? So that is equal to resection, resected bone plus where is the implant thickness? That is the philosophy. So you will end up with substantial valgus. Again in the flexion gap, you'll be okay because you'll be not doing any release, but you'll have to be careful how your component is rotated. Now in the adjusted mechanical alignment, always you'll be cutting the tibia at 90 degrees and you'll make an adjustment on the femur and you may accept two to three degrees of valgus on the femur. So here you have again reduced the amount of release you perform. This is my preference of, uh, this is my preferred choice in a valgus knee. Similarly, in the flexion uh, gap balancing, you will either need to do a release or you will have to internally rotate the femoral component. This is a choice that you will have to make whether you change it by means of cuts or you do a release. My personal preference is to do a release. And lastly, you have a restricted kinematic alignment where you want to bring it more or less within three degrees of HKA. You don't want some great degree of residual valgus. Uh, so you will end up doing a little bit of release, both in flexion as well as in extension. So now let's look at valgus deformities, the substantial valgus deformity. And let me tell you what Guruva was trying to portray as the magic of a robot has nothing to do with robots. It has to do with the software, which is basically even in robotic surgery is the same software that we've used for over 10 years in computer assisted surgery. The robot only goes and then makes the cut for you but the software is common. So here we are now keeping uh, first the tibial cut, then we balance the extension gap, um, and then check the flexion gap. Is it tight or loose, medially or laterally? So we first balance the extension gap uh, because it's too tight laterally. So what are your options? So you either release the IT band, which is the first step, we then release the posterior lateral corner. This usually suffices for most cases of valgus deformities. You don't really need to do too much. That's where you do the posterior lateral corner release. There's no need to release the popliteal tendon because that does not contract. And then if required, when your gap is too tight laterally, we do a sliding lateral epicondyle or osteotomy, bring it distally equal to the amount required to get a perfectly balanced extension gap. So now you've balanced your extension gap, you now have to figure out how to balance your flexion gap to the extension gap that you've created. And you have, again, multiple options of sizing the femur, moving it anterior posteriorly, uh, and rotating it. These are your options. By doing this, you can achieve a flexion gap which is balanced. So at the end of this, you would have perfectly balanced gaps. The difference between navigation and robotic is that you will do the cut with a saw. There the robot will do the cut based on what you've planned. So the same planning works in both navigation and computers because the software is the same. So an example of a rigid valgus deformity. Uh, here we had used a lateral approach, did a sliding osteotomy on both sides, perfectly aligned PS knee and mechanical alignment. Mechanical alignment, erring on the side of adjusted mechanical alignment for a valgus deformity. Now hyperextension, again a very difficult deformity. Make sure you rule out a neuro problem, and if so, then you may need to use a hinge. Assuming there's no neurological problem, like in this case, 14 degrees of hyperextension with valgus, the main thing here is to cut less on the tibia. Do not take your standard 8 mm cut. You need to take much less, maybe even 5 mm. You then check your extension gap and see uh, whether you're able to tighten it up. And for that, you need to resect less on the distal femur. So typically, again, 5 or 6. But this may even reduce further if the hyperextension is more severe. <clears throat> So now you've corrected your extension gap, you've got it balanced. If it's a varus deformity, you do the releases that uh, Pradeep mentioned. If it's a valgus deformity, you've already got it uh, um, corrected. And now you have to balance your flexion gap 
to your extension gap. And again, you use your femoral component size placement uh, in order to determine that you now have a balanced flexion gap. So these are the navigated um, images of a patient and here you can see that same patient perfectly balanced at the end of surgery. This is a, a combination of valgus with hyperextension on the right side. The left was done many years ago by another surgeon and you can see it's getting stretched laterally. So this is the patient at the time of suture removal. This was again a sliding lateral condylar osteotomy, a PS implant perfectly aligned and this is her four-year follow-up showing absolutely um, no change in the implant, stable and well aligned. So in summary, both these deformities are very challenging, but remember the cuts and releases are interrelated and depend on your alignment philosophy. Achieving balance may be done after the cuts are made or the cuts are made after you achieve balance. And you may achieve balance by doing releases or you may do so by adjusting component placement and size. So these are things that you have to keep in mind. You have to have a plan of action depending on your training, your instruments available to you, as well as your interpretation of the literature. And remember that most deformities do not need collateral ligament release. Thank you very much.